Okay, uh, yeah, let's let's maybe get started. Um, so, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are. Um, welcome to this webinar organized by the OECD Trade and Agriculture Directorate, uh, where we'll be discussing agricultural policies in the Asia-Pacific region, adapting agriculture to climate change. My name is Martin von Lampe. And I'm the head of the Policy Monitoring and Evaluation Unit within the OECD Trade and Agriculture Directorate. It is my pleasure to moderate this webinar today. Agriculture faces what we call a triple challenge. First, the sector needs to uh, ensure food and nutrition security for a global, global, growing global population. Second, it needs to provide livelihoods for hundreds of millions of farmers and other actors involved in the wider food system. And third, it needs to do so in a sustainable manner while contributing to reductions in GHG emissions and adapting to climate change. Governments around the world provide support to the sector to help address these challenges. The OECD has long been engaged in measuring and assessing um, the support provided to agriculture and our agricultural mo policy monitoring and evaluation report now covers 54 countries representing three quarters of global agricultural value added. The agricultural support provided in these countries is significant, and we will hear more about this later today. And the question is whether the support provided is helping the sector to improve food security, to sustain livelihoods, and to become more sustainable and climate friendly, and whether it does so efficiently. When ministers and high-level representatives from some 50 countries met in Paris for the OECD meeting of agricultural ministers in November 2022, there was a strong call for action to improve food security and nutrition, to ensure in inclusive livelihoods and to strengthen sustainability. In particular, they committed to develop and implement policies to facilitate climate change adaptation and to encourage sustainable productivity growth and to intensify efforts to reform and to reorient agricultural policies and environmentally harmful uh, support measures. Climate change is a major and complex issue for agriculture. Food production is affected by rising temperatures, changing, changes in precipitation patterns, rising sea levels, and the increasing frequency and severity of extreme weather events. Many countries in Asia and Pacific are particularly vulnerable and millions of farmers across the region urgently need to adapt their production to climate change. At the same time, agriculture is also a major contributor to climate change. The agriculture, forestry and other land use sector accounts for 22 of global greenhouse gas emissions. But the sector also offers ample opportunities for reducing emissions and can and must play an essential role in the fight against climate change. This webinar looks at agricultural policies in the Asia Pacific region and addresses the question of how those policies can help to can help agriculture to continue ensuring food security, livelihoods and environmental sustainability whilst helping farmers adapt to climate change. We are very fortunate to have an exciting lineup of speakers from the OECD, the Asian P Development Bank Institute, as well as a distinguished panel of policymakers and experts from across the region, from Australia, Indonesia, Japan, and Vietnam, who will provide their perspectives and experiences in designing and implementing policies to address these challenges. All this should provide ample input into an open discussion, which we hope to have at the end of this webinar. I would also like to acknowledge the many participants uh, joining us from around the world. We're very keen to hear you and from, from you throughout the event. Please type your questions into the chat as we go through the program, and we'll do our best to address them during the Q&A session at the end of the webinar. Finally, I'd like to note that this webinar is being recorded 
and we intend to upload um, the recording to the OECD Trade and Agriculture Directorate's YouTube channel after the event, so people can actually um, look at it after the event as well. Now, we have a full agenda with a range of excellent speakers today, so let's get started. Let me first give the floor to Gibran Puntakai. Gibran is an agricultural economist in the Agriculture and Resource Policy Division at the OECD Trade and Agricultural Directorate, and he will provide an overview um, of the key findings of the latest OECD Agricultural Policy Monitoring and Evaluation 2023 report. Gibran, please go ahead. Thank you, Martin. So today I'll present the key findings from our annual uh, flagship agricultural policy monitoring and evaluation report, which was published in November last year. The OECD has been engaged in measuring and assessing government support to agriculture for more than three decades. And we have developed a coherent system to measure and classify agricultural support and to provide quantitative estimates of public support to agriculture for producers, consumers, and general services that support the sector overall. Now our 2023 report includes a thematic focus on climate change adaptation, hence the focus of uh, this today's webinar. And uh, this thematic focus follows on from the previous report, which focused on climate change mitigation. This slide illustrates the geographic coverage of our report, which now includes a total of 54 countries. These include all 38 OECD member countries, which are shown in green. Uh, the entirety of the European Union, which is covered by a single chapter in our report and 11 major emerging economies, uh, which are shown in yellow. And these countries together account for approximately three quarters of global agricultural value added. So I'd like to start by presenting the headline numbers. So the latest numbers from our report averaged over the period from 2020 to 2022 show that governments provided 851 billion US dollars per year in support to the agricultural sector. Now, most of this support, $630 billion per year, is provided directly to producers. Then $106 billion per year was spent on general services, including R&D, biosecurity and infrastructure and other expenditures that benefit the sector overall. And finally, consumers and other first level buyers of agricultural commodities received $115 billion per year in budgetary support. Now, zooming in on the producer support on the second bar, we see that 333 billion US dollars per year is provided in the form of market price support which really refers to policies that lift domestic prices above reference prices. And then on the left-hand side, we see that actually uh, in several emerging economies, uh, policies suppress domestic prices for some or most commodities, gener generating annual transfers of $179 billion away from producers. Now, the remainder of producer support comes in the form of budgetary payments to producers, which includes payments based on output and input use, payments based on factors of production, uh, payments based on historical entitlements and payments for public goods. So in total, these amounted to $297 billion per year. And we can see that two thirds of producer support, so that's $411 billion per year, is market distorting and potentially harmful to long-term efforts to combat climate change and other food systems challenges. This includes market price support, payments based on output and payments based on variable input use provided without constraints. The remainder amounts to $218 billion per year provided in a less distorted format. So that is less coupled to production and to greenhouse gas emissions and only $1.6 billion per year provided 
in a non-distortive support for public goods, such as payments for ecosystem services. Now, looking at how this varies across countries, uh, specifically in the Asia Pacific region, we see that there's quite a lot of variation across the region. So, for instance, in Japan and Korea, support represents more than 50% of the value of agricultural production. And support is also high in the Philippines at nearly 30% of the value of agricultural production. In some countries, such as India and Indonesia, farmers face a combination of support for the production of some commodities, whilst other commodities are subject to implicit taxation due to export restrictions or other policies that suppress domestic prices. And you can see from the chart that India is also a substantial provider of consumer support, which is shown in orange. We see a similar picture in Vietnam. Uh, and in fact, in both India and Vietnam, the net support to agriculture is negative, meaning that domestic producers are implicitly taxed on average. Now, China is an interesting case because China is obviously a large agricultural producer and has actually emerged as the country provi providing the most support and has displaced large OECD economies, which have historically held that role. However, when viewed relative to the value of agricultural production, which is what's shown in this chart, China's support stands at 17%, which is close to the average for all 54 countries. And it's still a fair bit lower than the OECD average of 25%. And finally, we have uh, Australia and New Zealand, which both provide very low levels of support to their agricultural sectors. And policy settings are characterized by a strong emphasis on openness to international markets. So I'd like to say a few words about some of the policies that were introduced across the region in response to the war in Ukraine and uh, inflationary pressures more broadly. Now we know that the war in Ukraine disrupted international markets and value chains for agricultural commodities and key inputs including energy and fertilizers. And many governments extended emergency measures or put in place new measures to assist producers and consumers. So some of the measures introduced across the Asia Pacific region include helping Ukraine to continue producing and exporting food. Uh, so for, for instance, Australia was one of several countries that introduced temporary exemptions from tariffs on agricultural products imported from Ukraine. Reducing import barriers for food and fertilizers. This was observed in China and Korea. Fostering domestic fertilizer production. Uh, so for example, India increased its fertilizer subsidies twice during 2022. Japan subsidized transportation and storage costs for fertilizer manufacturers. And the Philippines introduced fertilizer discount vouchers. Then we have providing support to compensate for rising input costs. So for instance, China provided additional direct subsidies to grain farmers. Japan provided payments to livestock farmers to compensate for higher feed costs. Korea provided tax relief to farmers and direct compensation for higher feed and fertilizer costs. And the Philippines provided fuel discount vouchers to farmers. And countries also provided additional support to partly shield consumers from rising food costs. So for example, China began releasing its strategic supplies of pig meat and the Philippines imposed price ceilings for staple foods such as milk, beef, poultry, and pork. At the same time, some countries also implemented additional export barriers that added to pressures on international markets, increasing market uncertainty and risking increased global food insecurity. Most notably, India introduced export bans, duties, or permits uh, on several commodities, including wheat, rice, and sugar. And finally, some countries, uh, mostly in Europe, actually eased or suspended environmental requirements to encourage domestic production, which may have resulted in increased environmental degradation. Now, while overall support to agriculture has increased over time, 
expenditures on general services, including R&D and innovation, infrastructure and biosecurity, continue to represent a small share of transfers towards the agricultural sector. These investments are key to fostering sustainable productivity growth, adapting to climate change and addressing other food systems challenges. So here again, we see that expenditures on general services measured relative to the value of agricultural production vary significantly across Asia Pacific countries. They are highest in Japan and Korea, although infrastructure often for irrigation represents a large share of these expenditures, especially in Japan. Support for general services is also above the OECD average in the Philippines and India. And for the remaining countries in the region, general services expenditures as a share of the value of agricultural production are below the OECD average. So in Australia, we see there's uh, actually a strong emphasis on R&D and innovation, which accounts for more than half of general services support while in New Zealand, spending on general services is split roughly evenly between investments in R&D and biosecurity. And we also find that growth in R&D and innovation expenditures has slowed significantly, and it will be crucial to reverse this trend and increase the share of R&D expenditures in support of climate change adaptation. So our report outlines six transformative actions for policymakers to improve agriculture's resilience to climate change and other shocks. First, phase out measures that hinder adjustments to production, such as market price support and other policies targeting specific commodities that increase the rigidity of food systems by reducing farmers' incentives to adjust their production to changing conditions. Second, governments should ensure that risk-related information is available to farmers and other market participants, that insurance markets function well, and that recovery-related support focuses on large-scale systemic or catastrophic risks that cannot be borne by farmers or risk markets. Third, invest in targeted in interventions supporting climate change adaptation and the sector's transition to more sustainable and resilient agriculture and food systems. Fourth, favor no regret measures that support resilience in a wide range of circumstances. This could include facilitating international trade in agricultural commodities and their inputs, R&D focused on improved management of natural resources and the provision of other general services such as biosecurity and key infrastructure. Fifth, enhance the agricultural knowledge and innovation system and its focus on sustainable productivity growth. So here, public expenditures should really target productivity growth that reduces the sector's use of natural resources, its emissions of pollutants and their harmful effects. And finally, incentivize the supply of public goods. So this includes support for improved environmental outcomes um, and public goods such as biodiversity, conservation, water quality, habitat restoration, or other ecosystem services, and reorienting existing support that is distorting or environmentally harmful provides an opportunity for supporting public goods without requiring additional resources. Thank you very much. And uh, I'd encourage everyone to have a look uh, at our report on our website. Excellent. Thanks. Thanks so much, Gibran. Uh, some of you may already have uh, have questions or comments, so please do use uh, the chat function um, and type them in there. Uh, we'll go through uh, through them at the end of the um, of the webinar in the open discussion. Um, let me now hand over uh, to Kelly Coburn. Kelly is an agricultural economist in the Agriculture and Resource Policies Division at the OECD Trade and Agriculture Directorate. She was actually the lead author of the report's thematic chapter and will deliver a presentation on adapting agriculture to climate change lessons for the Asia Pacific region. Kelly, over to you. Thank you, Martin. Um, so uh, I will be talking about the thematic chapter that focuses on climate change adaptation. 
Um, so uh, as we know, uh, agriculture is already experiencing the impacts of climate change through changes in rainfall and temperatures, as well as changes in the provision of ecosystem services and the frequency and severity of extreme events. Uh, so what you can see in this graphic is that there's been a pronounced increase of about fourfold in the number of extreme events or natural disasters worldwide since the early 1970s uh, through to 2020. Um, so uh, even if we start to make progress towards mitigation goals, uh, we believe that adaptation is both urgent and essential. So to start thinking about uh, what countries are doing now uh, to support climate change adaptation in agriculture, uh, we wanted to address two questions in the thematic chapter of this report. The first is whether governments have become more interested in agricultural adaptation over time. And the second is what are governments currently doing to both support ad agricultural adaptation and potentially to impede it? So to answer the first question, what we did is we undertook an analysis of the documentation submitted by the 54 countries covered in the report to the UNFCCC, both through the convention and through the Paris Agreement. Um, so with that, we have a record of documentation submitted by governments over the course of 30 years, and we can start to assess the degree to which interest in climate change adaptation has changed over time. Looking at those reports, what we can see is that the expressed or articulated interest in climate change adaptation generally has increased by about fourfold over the past 30 years. Ideas related to resilience have begun to gain traction um, in these reports. So we can see that there's an increasing discussion of these concepts. When we look at agricultural references over time, what we see is that they've remained relatively constant in the national communications. However, the way that governments are discussing agriculture has changed. So what we can see, um, you're, on the left-hand side, you're looking at a graphic for OECD countries, and on the right-hand side, a graphic for the emerging economies covered in the report. What we can see is that the majority of the discussion of agriculture focuses on mitigation goals. Um, this is uh, more so for the OECD countries covered in the report. But that emphasis has been declining over time. What we see is that adaptation, which is in the blue, uh, has actually increased over the 30 years covered by the reports. Um, this is particularly true amongst the emerging economies covered in the report, uh, where um, documentation of adaptation needs is important to obtain climate financing. Uh, we see that emphasis on vulnerabilities has decreased uh, slightly over time in the reporting, and that more recently among OECD countries, there's been increased articulation of concerns related to adaptation mitigation co-benefits. Um, so our second question really following up on that is, okay, governments seem to be more interested in adaptation. Uh, what are they doing to try to support ad adaptation in the agricultural sector? And what actions might they be engaged in that could be potentially impeding adaptation? So for this, we undertook a stock take of adaptation programs and activities in the 54 countries covered in the report. We categorized the adaptation approaches and programs that were reported to us and that we um, gathered information on ourselves. And then we also evaluated the potential for distortions from existing policies. So what we found is that across the 54 countries covered in the report, uh, we found evidence of 600 adaptation programs currently in place. So what you're looking at on the right-hand side is a categorization of those adaptation programs where the size of the rectangle corresponds to the proportion of programs that are in that category. The majority of programs, which are represented in blue, fall into the category of social, economic, and institutional measures. So these really are measures that are undertaken by governments, such as uh, planning for adaptation or uh, risk contingency planning, uh, these are measures related to capacity building, um, such as uh, extension and training, and also measures related to climate services, such as early warning systems um, and uh, climate predict, uh, predictions, for example. So the majority of programs fall into this category, about 61%. The second greatest category falls into uh, what we would describe as ecosystem-based approaches to adaptation. So by and large, this includes things like efforts to implement agroecological measures, 
programs that attempt to improve soil health and fertility, and programs targeting um, increased diversification of agricultural systems. Those account for 19% of the programs reported to us. Following that at 11% are infrastructure and technological approaches to adaptation. So this includes things like um, uh, crop and livestock technology, as well as irrigation and drainage systems and regional water infrastructure. The final and smallest category coming in at 9% is behavioral and cultural measures. Um, so this includes programs that target directly changes in crop and livestock management or operations, as well as programs that are oriented towards breeding or breed selection. Um, so I'd like to point out that uh, the majority of measures reported by governments fall into this category of social, economic, and institutional support um, or programs to address adaptation. Um, but what's important about these measures is that they often support responses by producers. Um, for example, when extension services provided by a government as a form of capacity building enable farmers to uptake uh, drought tolerant crops. Um, so looking at uh, OECD countries and breaking out Asia Pacific um, in particular, uh, what we see is that 22% of all of the programs reported to us um, were reported from the Asia Pacific region. So that's 132 adaptation measures out of 600. What we see is that the um, majority are in the social, economic, and institutional category. It's similar to the OECD as a whole, um, so about 60%. There is a slight difference for the Asia Pacific region in the other categories. In particular, we see a greater proportion of programs that target infrastructure and technological approaches to adaptation. There's also a slightly greater emphasis on behavioral and cultural approaches. So this is real changes uh, in the field um, and a, a slightly lower emphasis on ecosystem based approaches when we look at the region as a whole. So although um, governments have developed a large body of programs to address agricultural adaptation, um, what we find is that really what's lacking at this point is attention to implementation, monitoring, and evaluation. Um, about 20% uh, of the measures for all of the countries monitored and 30% of the measures in the Asia Pacific region specifically are focused on developing plans or planning. Um, so really, at this point, what's needed is to gather more evidence on implementation of these adaptation programs and assessing the outcomes of those programs. So how do they support farmers to adapt? How do they contribute to resilience? Um, this is where there's really um, an opportunity uh, for investment at this point. Uh, we also find that uh, current policies are not always conducive to adaptation. So as Gibran mentioned, um, there are a large number of programs still in existence uh, that support specific commodities. And what we believe is that this type of support increases the rigidity of food systems and may impede adaptation. Um, also, trade distortions are still present, and those can prevent the, the flow of goods that can smooth um, supply disruptions uh, during periods of uh, extreme weather events, for example. Um, and then there are examples that still exist of poorly designed insurance subsidies and disaster assistance payments uh, that can, of course, contribute to moral hazard and impede adaptation or even worse, lead to malad maladaptive outcomes. Um, so uh, this, uh, I'll repeat some of the points that Gibran uh, focused on in the overall conclusions, but in a way that's specific to adaptation. Um, we really think that there's an opportunity uh, for policy reform at this point, and more than an opportunity, an urgent need uh, to reform policies to better support ad uh, adaptation. Um, foremost of uh, these recommendations is to phase out the most distortive forms of support that increase the rigidity of food systems. Um, we also believe that reorienting budgetary support uh, can be uh, used to invest in key general services, including innovation and research and development, um, to explore ways to enhance resilience while also uh, potentially supporting mitigation um, goals. We believe that uh, no regret measures that support resilience under a wide range of uncertain climate outcomes are uh, a worthy investment. And then also undertaking a targeted action for mitigation and adaptation, including reorienting environmentally harmful support to the provision of public goods um, can uh, better support resilience in the sector. 
Finally, uh, we would recommend considering actions also to support transformation and structural adjustment in the sector, um, which may include um, such measures as uh, measures that support diversification of income sources uh, for producers, as well as uh, considering off-farm employment opportunities, and then phasing out barriers to um, adaptive transformation, including um, subsidized insurance schemes and environmentally harmful support. Um, so with that, I will leave that there. Uh, and if you have any questions, uh, please don't hesitate to contact us. Thanks so much, Kelly, very well. Uh, let's move directly into uh, the presentation from the Asian Development Bank Institute. And we have Dr. Dil Rahut with us, who is uh, the Vice Chair of Research and Senior Research Fellow at the Asian Development Bank Institute in Tokyo. And Dr. Rahut will speak about climate smart agriculture for adaptation to climate risk. Dr. Rahut, the floor is yours. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you, Martin, for giving me this opportunity to present some of the findings from our work that we have been doing here at ADBI. Uh, basically, I'm going to present some of the key findings that we bring from a special issue that we did with uh, the journal, Journal of Mitigations and Adaptation Strategies for Global Change. So with that journal, we had a special issue and we had we had a large number of papers, uh, 15 papers. So from there, I draw this uh, uh, information to, to, to present to the group here today. Just to give you a brief background on the, on the climate change as Sivran, uh, and others highlighted that uh, the climate change is basically emerging from uh, from human activities, and it has increased significantly over the years. And we all have recognized that uh, that climate change is a is a is a major event that's happening, happening, and also touching everybody's life across the world. And uh, and and as as the as as it was highlighted in the previous presentations, that the intensity and the frequency of climate shocks has increased. There has been intense drought, intense flood, cyclonic event, heat waves, and altered rainfall pattern. And this climate change is adversely impacting the agriculture sectors. And, uh, and, and we have felt it, and we have acknowledged the impact of climate change on the agriculture sectors. Uh, and this, uh, this impact is resulting into food insecurity and nutritional insecurity, but uh, with the with the with the rate at which climate change is progressing, this threaten is uh, going to multiply and is going to uh, it could be catastrophic to all of us. Uh, however, one thing that I'd like to uh, I'd like the 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 participant to note here is that climate yes climate change is the is the uh, agriculture sectors is very vulnerable to the climate change, but also is appropriated to, to the climate change. It's it contributes to about a quarter of the GAG emissions. So we should also acknowledge that fact. Uh, the reason why agriculture is, is so vulnerable to, to, to climate change is because agriculture is directly dependent on weather conditions and hence extremely vulnerable to climate shocks. About 60% of the crop yield variability can be influenced by climatic conditions, making climate as an essential factor for productions. So having said this, I'd like to I'd like to reiterate what my uh, other uh, panelist uh, presenter pointed out that if uh, without any effort to adapt to climate change and mitigate the, the climate change at 1.5 to 2 degrees centigrade food security risks due to climate change could be catastrophic so this is something that I really want to emphasize and I really the, the reason why I want to emphasize here is that Mitigations can take long time, and well, we we attend net zero carbon emissions is very very important to adapt to climate change, particularly for the agriculture sectors, because almost 500 million farm households are smallholder farmers, and they have limited capacity to adapt to climate change. Any uh, failure to uh, to act and adapt to climate change would lead to malnutrition, micronutrient deficiency. If you look at globally today, almost two billion people are anemic, and and similarly other micronutrient deficiency. Hence, yeah, it is very very urgent that that we put uh, everything together to to adapt to the climate change, and and also 
if if we don't uh, if we don't do anything, uh, almost thirty six additional uh, thirty six percent of additional people could face hunger, and uh, and uh, under low emissions, also on uh, about 20, eleven to thirty three percent could face hunger. So so these are some of the points. Now for Asia, it's 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 very important. The reason is that. Uh, if you look at, uh, I've taken this uh, top 10 GAG uh, emitting countries from Asia from agriculture sector, FLU sectors. And if you see agriculture to GDP ratio, Asia has almost 7.7% of the GDP is uh, from agriculture sectors. And if you look at, by countries, you can see Pakistan is about 23%, Myanmar 23%, Indonesia 13%. So, so most of the Asian countries are heavily dependent on agriculture sectors for the economy. And similarly, if you look at the export, almost 4.2% of the total exports come from agriculture sectors. And if you look by countries, Indonesia, 22.4% of the export is from agriculture sectors and 25, almost 25% 25 for Myanmar. So all these countries have very, very high export uh, dependency on agriculture sectors and also a source of foreign exchange earning. And if you look at the, the number of people who are dependent on agriculture sectors, it's, it's humongous. So having said that, uh, uh, where we stand is that we have very high level of, uh, of, of, uh, of undernutrition. We also face severe uh, food insecurity globally, and, and so is in Asia. And all these countries also so similar kind of uh, thing. So, so, so under this situation, so what is it that we have for us, which is low cost and is clear, scalable? That's climate smart agriculture. Climate smart agriculture technology can play a very important role in climate change adaptations. Uh, so CSA is an integrated approach to managing landscape, cropland, livestock, forest, fisheries that addresses the interlinked challenges of food security and climate change. It aims to tackle three main objectives. Sustainably, in, uh, sustainably increasing agriculture productivity and income, adapting and building resilience to climate change, and reducing and removing greenhouse gas where possible. And the interventions that we have is, we have weather smart uh, uh, technology, water smart technology, seeds and breed smart, nutrient and carbon smart, market and financial smart, and institutional smart. The outcome is that we'll have better productions, uh, uh, food security, nutritional security, financial security, and resource security. And in the in CSA, you can see see there are a number of as uh, as as our uh, colleague from OECD pointed out that there are over six hundred uh, different kind of uh, of of, of uh, adaptations technology. Here I'm trying to point out some of the CSA the very prevalent CSA technology that's being adopted in. Uh, in South Asia, you can see the most important one is climate resilient seed. This is widely being practiced and most of the literature found so, uh, followed by water conservation technology. And then the other one is reduce zero or no tillage and farmyard manure, and then crop diversifications as pointed out by my colleagues from OECD and farm diversification. So we have areas of CSA technology, which could be low cost to high cost. So so, so depending on the affordability, farmers tend to use this technology to adapt to climate change and also to also contribute to net zero carbon emissions. And uh, and as 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 our colleagues uh, just highlighted that that we could clove this CSA technology into into various kinds. So here we have tried to clove into three different categories: the institutional factor, the socioeconomic factors, and and climate factor. Because of the the, the changing climate. Uh, the increasing rainfall, delay in rainfall patterns, uh, farmers tend to adapt, uh, adopt uh, uh, climate smart agriculture technology. And then uh, you can see the institutional factors that plays a very, very critical role. And, uh, and, and also uh, the other uh, social indicator. And here, just, it's, it's also important to note, uh, CSA adoptions not only help us to 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 protect our crop, our agriculture sectors, but also it helps in contributing to other SDGs. And we found that that CSA can through uh, through adoption of CSA, we can also significantly achieve the, achieve uh, 
uh, SDG one that's uh, that's uh, uh, reducing poverty and also contributes to zero hunger significantly and also it contributes to 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 clean water and sanitations and also climate actions. So so these are some of uh, and and I have highlighted how it helps. So. So one of the challenge for climate, uh, you know, like uh, uh, climate change adaptations and mitigations is the development finance. So I'll just show you some of the development finance. This is actually uh, uh, from from Southeast Asia. So so we find that uh, most of the climate related finance, it's actually we borrowed from OECD. It uh, it comes from uh, this major country like France, Japan, Korea, and Germany. These are the, the top 10 climate-related uh, finance providers in the world to the Southeast Asian countries. So, so France, Japan, Korea, Germany, Australia, they are among the top, and uh, others are, are contribute a little less. And most of these uh, this, uh, this, uh, climate-related finance are grant. These are grants, and, and, and all, about 33% are from loan. And then, uh, who, in which sectors get most of this climate-related funding? If you look at it, it's most. It mostly comes to multi-sectors: water supply, disasters, transport, and is about 194, which is quite low. But given the vulnerability of agriculture sectors, given the that the farmers have limited capacity to adapt to uh, to, to climate. And also the importance of agriculture sectors for ensuring food, nutritional security, and also tackling uh, poverty. I think we need to put in bigger amount of resources, climate uh, finance resources, to the agriculture, forestry, and fisheries sectors. So now coming back to climate adaptations, if you look at climate adaptations finance, it's mostly coming from Japan, France, Korea, Germany, uh, and Australia, and then rest. Uh, the top, uh, they are top ten, and the rest are quite small. So, so these are the countries that contributes to the climate uh, adaptations. And uh, also, if you look at it by sectors, agriculture sectors is not is 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 in the middle, uh, whereas other sectors receive huge amount of money. So, so as I already pointed out, we we need to see how we can we can focus uh, redirect uh, climate adaptations finance to agriculture sectors so as to so as to ensure food security and also to be able to attend uh, most of the SDGs. And uh, in the mitigation finance, you can see the, the France and Australia are the, are the largest providers. Uh, and it's mostly like uh, it's, it's in between, like uh, we have debt also as much as the grants. And uh, the recipients here, if you look at it, uh, it's uh, agriculture sectors also is not the highest. It comes in between energy sectors receive the most. I think that's also correct because energy contributes to about three quarter of the GAG emissions. And finally, to conclude, uh, and, uh, yes, we have made a significant production uh, progress in terms of agriculture productions and also achieving food and nutrition security. But the climate change is... Uh, is rapidly rising with uh, with increase in the intensity of uh, of flood, drought, uh, irregular rainfall, and posing significant threat to the agriculture sectors as agriculture sectors is uh, weather sensitive. Therefore, if you want to protect the the livelihoods of uh, of uh, over two billion smallholders. Uh, like 400, 500 families, but 2 billion farmers who are dependent on agricultural sectors, we really need to invest on adaptations uh, to climate change. Failure to, to invest on adaptations will not only affect this family, but also will affect export earning, will also affect the economy and other dependent fact, uh, the allied industries. And uh, so, so climate, uh, climate smart agriculture, it's low cost and easily scalable. We don't need a high uh, amount of skill. So it, it's very scalable. So, so trying to promote climate smart agricultures uh, could, could, could significantly contribute in adaptations to climate change in the agriculture sectors. Uh, so failure to adapt to climate change would threaten food and nutritional security. 
uh, and uh, and uh, and I would say that smallholders, particularly from from developing countries, are the most vulnerable. Therefore, uh, one of the barrier for scaling climate uh, smart agriculture technology is the financing. So so I I would like to strongly urge the government international communities to invest on 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 research and development in climate smart agriculture technology and also scaling it up. Uh, with this, I'd like to thank everyone and uh, and OECD for giving me an opportunity to present uh, some of the key highlights from our our special issue. Thank you very much. Many thanks, Dr. Rahul, for this insightful presentation. Um, let's now move into the um, panel discussion. Uh, we'll hear from policymakers and experts from across the Asia Pacific region. And in fact, we have four panelists with us today, and each of them will share their country's experience in helping agriculture to adapt to climate change. And each representative will speak for about five to six, maybe seven minutes. Um, firstly, we'll hear from Tim Whitnell, who is an economist for trade and global change at ABARES, the Australian Bureau for Agricultural and Resource Economics and Sciences. And I should add, that Tim also worked with us at the OECD last year and is one of the leading authors of the 2023 monitoring report. In fact, he co-authored the thematic chapter on climate change adaptation together with Kelly and Gibran and was the lead author of chapter two on developments in agricultural policy and support. Tim, you have the floor. Thanks, Martin, for that introduction. I'll just put my slides up on the screen. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. And thanks to the OECD for the opportunity to present on Australia's experience with climate change adaptation policy. So climate change is a particularly pressing issue for Australian agriculture. Australia is among the set of countries which already face lower than average rainfall and high rainfall variability. So Australia's climate has warmed on average by 1.4 degrees Celsius since 1910. Winter season rainfall has dropped by up to 20% since 1970 in some key cropping regions. And recent ABARES work has estimated that the shift in climate conditions since the year 2000 has reduced farm profits by an average of 23% or around 29,000 Australian dollars per year, which at today's exchange rate is about 19,000 US dollars. Looking ahead, ABARES simulations suggest that farm profits in 2050 could range from between 2 and 32% below the historical climate period if warming is kept to the IPCC's intermediate projections. This evidence suggests that Australian farmers are in fact already adapting to the longer term changes in climate. So the orange line in this chart shows the total factor productivity of cropping farms in Australia since the late 1980s. And while it has been increasing, it's been heavily influenced by periodic episodes of severe drought in the early to mid 2000s and from 2018 to 2020. The red line on the other hand shows the TFP after controlling for the effects of climate, where we see farm productivity has been growing much more steadily and has in fact climbed 68% since the 1980s. So farmers have made a variety of management practice changes to adapt to reduce winter rainfall. For example, around 70% of Australian cropping farms now engage in minimum or no-till practices to better retain summer soil moisture. There's also evidence of shifts in location of farming activity happening over time, with cropping activity moving to higher rainfall zones on the coast and away from some inland areas that have been affected by the deteriorating climate. So farmers are incentivized to adapt in order to improve their own long-term profitability. And as we've seen, there is evidence that this is already underway. So then what's the role for policy? Well, in Australia, the strategic intent of climate policy has shifted away from seeking to protect and insulate farmers towards enabling farmer preparedness and self-reliance. In some cases, well-intentioned policies that seek to insulate farmers or compensate for losses from climate events can in fact disadvantage farmers who have been better prepared compared to farmers who have provided assistance and relief. This can dilute management incentives and raises some difficult equity issues. So supporting farm households experiencing hardship is of course legitimate and important, but for the long-term health of the farm sector, this needs to be done in ways that promote resilience and improve productivity, 
and allows for adjustment and change. So in short, policy needs to get ahead of the curve. So how do we do that? I'll run through just a few examples of things that Australia is doing to enable farmers to adapt. The first of those is through better information. So uncertainties over the future climate can be a major hindrance preventing necessary long-term investments. As an example of better information, ABES is part of a program to establish a national drought early warning system, which will develop a set of indicators for measuring and forecasting the extent and severity of drought impacts on Australian agriculture. How you, how you then communicate this information is also an important consideration. The early warning system will join other information that's already available through online portals, such as those you can see on screen now, the drought resilience self-assessment tool and climate service for agriculture where farmers can log on and find tailored information for their area, including projections of their own future climate. The second way of enabling adaptation is through research and development. So Australia has long established research and development corporations for 15 major agricultural commodity groups produced in Australia, which are funded jointly through producer levies that are matched by the government. This commodity-based system is well-placed to research the incremental adaptation needed to improve traditional crop and livestock production systems, such as drought-tolerant varieties suited to our local growing conditions. A third way of assist assisting farmers uh, to adapt is incentivizing risk management. As an example of this, Australia provides farm management deposits, a scheme which provides a mechanism for farmers to benefit from tax advantage savings in high um, production and profit years that can be drawn upon in times of lower rainfall, putting a new spin on the old proverb of saving for a rainy day. As of February of this year, there are around $6 billion in these savings schemes, providing a buffer for farms in the event of adverse conditions. And then the last thing I wanted to touch on was our limited support, which enables transformation. So the long-term of consequences of climate change for Australian agriculture are difficult to quantify. If recent trends continue, it suggests we may need to see continued structural changes occur, such as shifts in location of farming activity or shifts from cropping into more livestock or mixed farming. We're also likely to see further farm consolidation into fewer, larger farms, which tend to be more profitable and better able to adapt to adverse conditions. And there's also potential opportunities for transitions to other land uses, such as sequestration or green energy production to replace or complement farm incomes. Australia's low support environment means that there are fewer impediments to this sort of transformational change, as it does not lock producers into existing production patterns. So there are, of course, lots of other areas that are important to climate change adaptation, such as infrastructure and biosecurity, but for the sake of time, I'll leave it there. Thanks again to the OECD for putting on this webinar on an important topic, and I look forward to the panel discussion. Thanks so much, Tim. Um, our next speaker is Talim Surarianto, a Senior Agricultural Economist at Indonesia's National Research and Innovation Agency, BRIN. Uh, Mr. Surarianto, uh, over to you, please. Sorry, I mute the microphone. Yeah, okay, thank you very much, uh, Martin, for the uh, opportunity. Uh, I will be very, very brief uh, to speak on uh, first uh, related to technology innovations. Uh, this slide is uh, on. No, we can't see it. It was on, but not in full full screens uh, mode. Um, and now it's off again. Can you see it? No, we don't. Oh, sorry.
but if if this slides don't work maybe you speak without them or Well, just if we see this, if we should see the slides now. If you just go to the first one and don't worry okay. about the full full screen, that's okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. To uh, begin with, just uh, review what's the uh, current uh, initiative, mostly on uh, related to technology uh, innovations, uh, intended to promote the sustainable productivity productivity growth. I think as mentioned by previous uh, speaker as well, uh, mostly focus in addition to technology that uh, enhance uh, increase on productivity, but also to uh, related to sustainability. So it consists about technology, crop varieties and livestock breed, and also the climate uh, smart uh, practices and technologies just to mention a few, uh, again, uh, varieties, uh, calendar system, water balance, and efficient equipment and maintenance. Um, yeah, just to mention the number, in uh, 2015, 21 for example, there are uh, roughly five or seven crop varieties. And uh, in 2002, out of these two, uh, uh, two or eight varieties has been uh, disseminated and uh, transferred to the farmer. Uh, but uh, there is some uh, institutional problem in view of uh, uh, emphasizing the role of R&D in Indonesia. So uh, perhaps uh, you uh, follow the development that uh, since 21-22, R&D function in, in the technical ministries, including Ministry of Agriculture, has been integrated into the newly created agency, National Research and Innovation, Agency, uh, so that uh, MOA lose our ED function and uh, significant human resources. So, uh, how is then the flow of technology innovation from BRIN into Ministry of Agriculture? So, in the past, uh, before integrated into BRIN, the RD result from uh, MOA had been well connected to the extension uh, system and agricultural field programs. Uh, currently, Brin uh, established a coordination forum to link the R&D program and result responding to the need of uh, MOA. But then the effectiveness of this forum is yet uh, to be assessed. So uh, in summary, currently there is uh, some kind of missing link between R&D program at Brin and the agricultural development program at Ministry of Agriculture. Uh, there is a proposal ongoing to establish a unit within more to uh, bridge more, system more systematically on the technology innovation flow from uh, particularly from green to the uh, to the ministry. And the second uh, point that I would like to emphasize is uh, related to pure future agriculture and. Um, uh, so most uh, recent study, including my own study uh, on rural transformation, shed some light on the following. First, uh, there are two indicators. Agriculture production has been transformed from staple food, in, including rice, to what the more high value commodities, 40.6% uh, in 1999, for example, has uh, uh, increased to 50.2% in in the last decade. And also uh, the second indicator is the rural employment has been shifted to uh, the non-farm sector from 28 to uh, 66% in the same uh, period. And uh, more importantly, this uh, formation is, uh, has some impact, positive impact to higher rural household income and lower property incident. I think there's uh, two major uh, policy, uh, policy goals for the government. Uh, but uh, as, as we see also, in the, you mentioned also in the report earlier, the current support policies and program continues to focus heavily on the staple food production to achieve sufficiency. 
uh, for example, to uh, illustrate the number during 2015-2020, roughly 50% of R&D budget allocated to increase productivity on staple food, which actually rise. And uh, major uh, support policies of sector relation subsidy and market price to import control. So uh, there is current proposal of uh, the ministry to increase the, the subsidized fertilizer by 100 percent in uh, from 2023 to 2024 currently, and uh, the same thing is uh, uh, the corresponding increase with the budget uh, related to this uh, policy. So there is concern on major impact to the emissions and other imperial factors so that the uh, policy recommendation to uh, uh, phase out this, uh, the fertilizer subsidy I think still in place uh, even though there is no progress so far on this subject. I think I, I stop there Martin. thank you very much. Thanks, thanks very much uh, Mr. Sudarianto. And our third uh, panelist is Hajime Sugimura, uh, Deputy Director of the International Strategy Division in the International Bureau of the Ministry of Agriculture, Forestry and Fisheries of Japan. Mr. Sugimura, over to you, please. Thank you, and it is uh, my great honor to join this outreach event uh, for the Asia Plastic region. So I'm starting with an oral outreach star, so if I'm around. So before getting to the uh, main topic, I'd like to share my uh, personal ob observation I made regarding the climate change and adaptation trends and agriculture policy during uh, my attendance at COP28 in Dubai last December. Um, I was actually shocked by the significant presence of over 100,000 participants, but the presence of agricultural policy makers and experts uh, was a little bit invisible for me, at least for me. So the Ministry of Environment and Environmental Groups took center stage in the negotiation discussion. So, um, but I think it's never too late to bounce back. So to put agriculture back into the mainstream um, in the uh, discussion of the climate change adaptation. So it might be essential for agricultural stakeholders in each country to actively engage in climate change discussions and address adaptation and mitigation strategies in holistic manners. So uh, from that perspective of view, so today's event is so valuable for policy makers and experts across the Asian Pacific region for mutual learning and collaboration with the OECD, the leading international organization in this area. So um, please let me move to today's main topic. I'd like to explain two topics very briefly. Uh, Japan's approach to agriculture policy for adaptation and our stance on international cooperation. So Japan, um, as, as you might all know, uh, Japan has a very long, narrow uh, land area uh, riding, from, riding from north to south around 3,000 kilometers and the natural conditions vary greatly from place to place. So Japan is also vulnerable, particularly vulnerable to natural disasters due to its uh, geographical conditions. So under this condition, our approach to adaptation um, put importance on the utilization of local resources and the sustainable enhancement of productivity and the improvement of resilience and uh, we also emphasize the promotion of environmentally beneficial agricultural practices. To achieve these goals, we, we, uh, uh, we are underscores, underscoring technological innovation and collaboration with all across stakeholders, including private companies, research institutions, and consumers. Um, for example, in August last year, we uh, re-established, we revised an uh, agricultural policy package targeting climate change adaptation, which has mainly five policy targets. So the first one is research and development on high temperature resilient and high quality crop varieties like rice and fruit trees. And the second point is uh, integrated pest control uh, that can respond to an increase in pests and diseases. 
And the third point is climate smart agriculture using AI and ICT. And the fourth point is risk management by producers and producer groups using insurance systems. And the final point is disaster resilience uh, by maintaining and developing the function of agricultural infrastructure, mainly targeting irrigation system. And I'd like to, uh, on top of that, I'd like to add some three, uh, some topics uh, that we are recently focusing on. The first one is uh, in discussions of climate change, um, various initiatives focusing on adaptation and mitigation in agriculture, such as AIM for Climate and VAX. Um, so one of the interesting topics in uh, policy approach that directly connects producers and the researchers. You, you, to use the full-scale on-farm data to develop feasible and viable technologies rapidly. So agricultural policy can support such approach to improve farmers' livelihoods and promote adaptation at the same time. The second point is, uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, for those countries with many natural disasters like Japan, I believe two-side approach is very important. So one is a uh, infrastructure resilience, and the second point is the risk management by producers by themselves. For example, Japan has introduced a cross-commodity agricultural insurance system for farmers that compensate for income loss in the event of extreme disasters. So by supporting the operation of this system, the government can contribute to stabilizing farmers' livelihoods. The final point is also um, um, regarding the climate change adaptation. So communication with various stakeholders uh, is quite important, especially uh, for those who are a little bit distant, relatively distant from the farm, like distributors, retailers, and the consumers. Uh, for example, we are, um, um, we are promoting the visualization of producers' efforts for adaptation and mitigation that can enhance the understanding of consumers by using labels um, labels and uh, um, the standards for the among supply chain stakeholders. Uh, I move to the um, second topic for uh, the Japan's cooperation with the Asia Pacific region, briefly. Um, we chaired the G7 ministerial meeting last year and we delivered a clear commitment to promote climate change adaptation and mitigation, and that was uh, endorsed by the Emirates Declaration, uh, which was announced at COP28 last December. And uh, all, Japan also joined the declaration, of course. So, and uh, based on such a kind of a, a high-level international agreement, we are promoting international cooperation with ASEAN region, uh, which shares similar natural conditions by utilizing. Japan's advanced uh, agricultural technology. Uh, for example, we are uh, collaborating right now, we are collaborating with ADB uh, to use the joint credit mechanism scheme to contribute to the climate change response in agriculture, agriculture sector across the ASEAN region. So um, I, I for starting from the uh, my personal experience, I stop here and uh, I, 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 I look forward to further discussions and learning from our colleagues today. I, I give it back to you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks so much. Um, that was very useful. Um, before we move to the last speaker, maybe just a just a reminder that we have the chat function where you can put your questions um, for the open discussion. Um, and at the last uh, at, at the at the last uh, panelist, we'll have uh, Mr. Tran Kong Tang. Director General of the Institute of Policy and Strategy for Agriculture and Rural Development in Vietnam. Mr. Tang, the floor is yours. Okay, so can, can you hear me? Yes, we hear you well. Uh, can you uh, give me the, the right to share the screen? Because uh, here I cannot share my screen. So I need the host uh, to allow me to share the screen. Jibran, can you do that? Should be working now. Uh, 
Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, we do. Uh, okay, so thank you very much. So first, thank you, IC, to apply the very interesting uh, uh, workshop, uh, webinar, with a very interesting topic about the climate change adaptation in agricultural sectors. And uh, I, I go very uh, uh, straightforward to some uh, issue that we would like to talk. The first uh, issue related to the Vietnam experience with the agriculture policy reform to uh, support the climate change adaptation in agriculture sectors. Uh, and uh, I think similar to other country, Vietnam uh, is very in uh, and very active with the climate change and climate change adaptation and mitigation as well is one of the priority of the government. That's why the uh, all the issues related to the climate change adaptation were the Vietnam in each in different uh, laws and uh, strategy. Uh, for example, in Vietnam we have an environmental protection law, uh, we have a disaster prevention and control law. And uh, we have a forest, uh, forest tree law, we have irrigation law. So all oh, uh, the law addressed climate adaptation and mitigation is a very uh, a crucial uh, solution for, for uh, agriculture development in Vietnam. And so the adaptation uh, strategy uh, is invented by the government uh, through different uh, strategy. And in Vietnam, we have a uh, climate change adaptation strategy. And, uh, uh, the climate change action also integrated to different uh, strategy like the green growth uh, strategy and the strategy for agriculture and rural development, the strategy for the disaster presentation and uh, uh, and also the strategy for factory development as well. So uh, it means that uh, there's a different policy word applies and implemented uh, to adapt with the climate change and also for the climate change or mitigation. Uh, in terms of the, the policy uh, measure for adaptation, uh, in Vietnam, we can uh, categorize by three kinds, honestly two, two kinds of solution. The first one in the measures uh, we mentioned about the construction solution. Uh, so uh, by, by this uh, solution, the government is uh, very focused on uh, developing the some like infrastructure construction, especially uh, in Vietnam, we focus on irrigation. And uh, so far, uh, the government spent uh, around 60 to 70 percent of total investment in agriculture for irrigation. However, the irrigation in Vietnam now is very diversified. It's like a multi purpose irrigation, uh, such as a uh, uh, slide uh, intrusion prevention, uh, proactive irrigation hydro powers irrigated uh, irrigation so those uh, pro uh, uh, construction and infrastructure is a uh, very supportive for agriculture production uh, to make sure that uh, uh, it's very posi positively to support the uh, the farmers uh, uh, farmers farming in vietnam and uh, and and um, to help the farmer to adapt with the climate change and uh, the second uh, measure in Vietnam we call the non construction solution. It also is one of the priority for the government. And it brings the co-benefits uh, for farmers. And uh, there's a different kinds of the uh, non construction solution uh, are stimulated and uh, in the apply in Vietnam. For example, like you already mentioned about the uh, CSA. Uh, however, in Vietnam is a very diversified because the uh, the, the the condition for agriculture in Vietnam diversify and we have a different ecological reason. That's why the uh, we mainly base uh, apply the natural based solution. Uh, however, it's a very diversified. For example, uh, we have a uh, uh, we have a, a different kinds of model like a reproduction infiltration with the coastal and uh, area. And in the uh, in the Mekong Delta, we have another ways. For example, we uh, we support the farmer to transition uh, to change from the rice to others. Like uh, for example, uh, rice stream or uh, maybe uh, rice fish. So it's very diversified uh, to enhance with the uh, how can I say the sanitary infusion. So. Uh, that is a very good way to support the farmer to increase the income and also to adapt with the sanitary intrusion as well. 
and in some area we also the government uh, support the farmer to converting to convert the inefficient uh, cropland to a more profitable uh, area. For example, uh, in uh, in uh, in center highland, the government uh, support the farmer and encourage farmer to change from the coffee to the coffee fruit uh, tree crop integration. So that is uh, help the farmer also increase the income as well. Uh, and uh, the third one, it could be included in, in, in one of the like uh, other construction or non-construction solution, but I would like to put it separately like a public investment policy. So in in here, uh, uh, due to the, you know, due to some area, especially like in in coastal area and also in Mekum Delta, uh, where a lot of like the poor farmer and low income farmer are living. That's why the government in Vietnam now in recent year is very very focused uh, on the public investment in this area. So that is the the, the major uh, policy and the measure in Vietnam for climate change adaptation. And uh, uh, I I would like to talk about the second uh, like a question you already mentioned about how like a uh, can agriculture support policy in Asia, uh, Asia Pacific country to contribute with the climate change adaptation uh, and uh, it's to ensure the food security and uh, livelihood for the farmer. I think uh, there's a uh, different kinds of the policy in here. Uh, I think we can. Uh, there's uh, three way we can support to do it. The first one, like uh, we can uh, have some policy to support the farmer uh, in, like uh, we call the transition or changing the uh, production. Uh, how I, I'm sure that it depends on different country. However, in long term, it is a very uh, important to focus on sustainable production, uh, especially. Uh, here in Vietnam, we have uh, like uh, uh, climate change adaptation, climate resignation, and greenhouse gas emission reduction. Uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, speaker mentioned about uh, like CSAs or uh, nature based solution. Uh, so that is a very important thing. Is the first one. The second one, I think, in, with the, the from Vietnam, we found that uh, when the farmer do transition, they face a lot of uh, problem in terms of uh, financing, in terms of skills, or in terms of the policy reform. That's why the the policy mechanism to support or to mobilize the financial resource with the like uh, and also the training capacity building is a very important. Uh, especially here in Vietnam, we not only support the farmer, we also support the community and the cooperative. Uh, that is a very important. The uh, thing, and also uh, the we take the experience from the Vietnam when we move from the uh, right to fish uh, or right to swim. One of another important thing is that we need to think of the market for the uh, some uh, uh, some uh, the commodity when we change from right. That's why the uh, we are very uh, focusing on the marketing between the farmers and at the right. And uh, the the first issue we found that in Vietnam, uh, to make sure that the uh, and to ensure the security, especially the for for uh, small holders, as you know that Vietnam is one of the you know top rice exporter. However, the rice farmer are the florist in the in the agriculture household. So, uh, however, the right contributes a very important role in terms of food security and in terms of social stability. That's why in Vietnam, we have a separated program uh, to support the right farmer. And uh, recently, uh, Vietnam just launched a very big program. Either we call the one million hectare uh, program of high quality and low carbon right. So that is the, the very important thing. That's why I'm not sure for, for the other country, but in Vietnam, the right land are right and uh, protected it, uh, it is a very important to ensure the food security uh, in vietnam and uh, sorry and i think the the last point i want, uh, would like to talk about the uh, what approach can help the farmer in asia pacific region to have a better adaptation to climate change so i think there's a different way 
uh, from the speaker. Uh, before that, I found that we already mentioned different way. However, from Vietnam, I think we have uh, like a six uh, six ways, six priority to support and to have farmer. The first one, I think that we need to 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 have like uh, some prioritize for the different kinds of measures that based on. Uh, uh, we, we need to ratify and, uh, and uh, measure based on the uh, farmer income and productivity. Uh, and it means that the, when the farmer changes to the uh, new uh, system, it still has support them to ensure the income. So that is a very important thing because uh, otherwise the farmer will not you know, follow. They may they may apply the what they want and they may apply the what uh, help them to get the high income? So that is a very important thing. Uh, and I think it's more important uh, because we have a lot of experience. That's why the, we can create the forum to exchange knowledge, the policy dialogue, and we can learn uh, each other in both in terms of policy and practice. Uh, and the third one is the, about the mobilize the financial resource. So I think it's a very important thing. In Vietnam, we so uh, try to find the new uh, financing policy, just like uh, agriculture insurance. Uh, honestly, the agriculture insurance in Vietnam uh, is uh, grows very slow, develops very slowly. I think in the future, it's is a very important uh, finance inducement to support the farmer. And uh, uh, the another one is the uh, enhancing the legal framework for the reform, as uh, I mentioned, uh, like in Vietnam. Now, before uh, the right hand cannot change, cannot switch to others. So, in fact, the right farmer had to keep on on rice. However, recently we changed. So, with the right, in the rice uh, area, uh, with the low uh, productivity, and especially the right when we have a, uh, have a uh, big impact by the climate change, especially sanitary intrusion. So, the government allowed them to change to the swim and fish. So oh, that's why they can get a high income. So that is a good one. And the last point here, the investment policy, especially both in infra and non-infrastructure management. So we cannot invest only in hard, like infrastructure or construction. We need to invest both in uh, in construction and also non-construction. So that is the, the, the major idea from Vietnam. And, uh, and uh, Again, so thank you very much. So I think that uh, it's very helpful to Joyce and to learn from experience from other country. Thank you very much. Thanks, thanks very much, uh, Mr. Tang, and many thanks indeed for all to all the panelists for these excellent interventions. Uh, let's move uh, to uh, the open discussion that we have, um, and in fact, we have the first uh, question already in the in the chat. Uh, coming from James Fell from uh, from Abers, um, and the question I think goes to probably um, to Indonesia. Um, Indonesia is moving its capital partly in response to climate change. Can we expect the location of agriculture in Southeast Asia to also move on such a big scale? Can policies throughout Southeast Asia be liberalized to help enable farmers to choose what, where, and how they produce? Um, I guess uh, that's probably to Mr. Sudarianto, if, if you want to respond to that. We can't hear you. Yeah. Ah. Okay, I'm uh, trying to uh, digest the, the questions. Um, Yeah, yeah, I think uh, uh, that, that that's uh, that's possible, but uh, of course uh, it needs some, um, you know, uh, uh, cooperation and uh, and uh, common talk uh, within uh, South Asia's uh, member countries to add uh, that uh, that initiative. If you know, if it's agreeable to to. Uh, all relevant countries. That's that that possible. That's perhaps uh, uh, that's my 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 uh, quick answer on this subject. Thank you. 
Okay, thank thank you very much. Um, I may may just want to want to ask a question to uh, Dr. Rahut, if I if I may also um, just use my uh, my role as the moderator here. You presented some really interesting statistics on the landscape of financing for climate change adaptation and mitigation in the Asia Pacific region. And I wonder what are the main challenges for scaling up uh, financing for agricultural adaptation across the region? Would you would you mind to maybe elaborate a bit on that? Uh, thank you, Dr. Martin. I think it's a very important question. And uh, and and if you see my former panelists also, they strongly highlighted the need for more financing on the agriculture sectors, and the reason why. Uh, there is needs uh, more need for uh, you know investment in the financial sector is because this is the most vulnerable sectors that's one and second thing is that most of the people who are in the agriculture sectors are smallholder farmers who, who are, whose land holding is less than five, five hectares so they are the one who needs most financing when you come to climate but despite the fact they don't receive enough and if you look at like you know 2017 18 you can see only about 20 billion per year was allocated to agriculture sectors globally. I'm talking about globally. And then when you go to mitigations and then mitigation was only about uh, like, you know, about uh, 8 billion. So it's, it's, it's smallholder farm again, only got only about 8 billion, it's very tiny. The reason is because uh, one of the thing is that uh, it's, I think one is lack of knowledge. Second thing is that uh, the, the domestic resources that we have, and there is a competing need, so it's very difficult to put in resources, domestic resources for climate adaptations in agriculture sectors. And also globally, I think most of the financing in the agriculture sectors goes as the subsidies for fertilizers, uh, pumps, and other use. And it's very important that we divert this uh, this uh, this financing for for uh, for let's say um, uh, more uh, polluting uh, inputs to 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 adaptations and mitigations and uh, and uh, and uh, and even in the like uh, like our friend from japan uh, like uh, highlighted even in the cop uh, uh, 29 you could see that uh, the folk uh, the most of the discussions was led by environmental ministry of environments and and agriculture had very small space so somehow i think we need more space in the global forum agriculture sectors need to be well represented so they can raise their case and, and, and ensure that uh, they get enough resources to finance mitigation, but also adaptations, because the mitigation is not going to happen today. I mean, like net zero carbon emissions will take another 40, 50 years. Till then, the smallholder farmer need to adapt. So, so we really need to, uh, you know, experts like OECD, uh, particularly agriculture departments and, and government uh, agriculture departments needs to lobby uh, in COPs and other global forums to to ensure that we get enough resources for financing adaptations and mitigations in the agriculture sectors. Excellent, thanks Thanks very much. Uh, we, we do run out of time here and I'm conscious of time, but I do want to just maybe uh, give a chance to have a uh, discussion on the last question that we just see on the, on the chat um, before we uh, close the meeting with some closing remarks. Um, but the, there's one question from Pradeep Mela Mita, I'm sorry. Um, and the question is, how is indigenous knowledge taken into account while drafting climate resilient policies? I'm not so sure who might be able to respond to that question, although I do think it's it's really important. And I wonder maybe, um, Tim, do you have a do you have a view on 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 that, given that you also have um you know a lot of discussion about indigenous peoples uh, in your country? <laughs> Yeah, uh, thanks, Martin. Yeah, no, um, it's a good question. Um, indigenous knowledge is obviously uh, can be an important part of the solution for climate change. Um, so part of the climate services for agriculture funding that I believe uh, Mr. Rahut was talking about, the 300 million that uh, is in climate smart agricultural programs in Australia, most of those are, is, is, is for grants um, uh, like small grants that are like sort of pilot programs that can, uh, you know, test out new knowledge and innovation. And a lot of those are involved in going to First Nation groups um, oh. and research organizations, which, um, yeah, obviously, then the next stage of that is extension programs. After that, how do you communicate that information? Um, 
which obviously the future drought fund in Australia is is geared at sort of longer term solutions to um, to climate change in Australia. So hopefully we'll see more in that space as we go go forward. Super. Thanks. Thanks very much, Tim. Um, this this has really been been a really nice nice discussion, and I really enjoyed it. Unfortunately, we really need to move on and probably have to close here. Um, please, to all of those who have other questions, please do feel free to send us emails and we'll obviously be happy to follow up bilaterally. I would now, now like to pass the floor to Julia Nielsen, our Deputy Director of the OECD Trade and Agriculture Directorate, to deliver some closing remarks. Julia, the floor is yours. Thanks very much. And look, thank you for uh, what has been a very, very interesting set of presentations and discussions. So let me let me just uh, make a few overarching points about, about what I've heard by way of summing up. So look, firstly, we heard that agriculture in the Asia Pacific region is very strongly exposed and affected by climate change. So temperatures, sea level, extreme weather events and changing rainfall are all hitting ag in the region. But secondly, that the region also accounts for more than half of the global population and levels of food insecurity and undernourishment remain very high. And this is likely, we're likely to see further strains as income increases boost demand for high quality and, and nutritious food. We also heard that agriculture is very key for livelihoods in the region, both for smallholders and as an important source of exports and revenue. But as our colleague from the ADB said, um, the agriculture sector is both a victim and a perpetrator in the region. It is a major source of emissions. And there's a urgent need to adapt agriculture to climate change in order to safeguard food security. If we don't act, the effects will be catastrophic. And indeed, we're already starting to see some of those impacts, especially on the most vulnerable like smallholders. So we need to act, but what do we need to do? So I think one of the first messages we heard is there's an urgent need to scale up climate finance, both for adaptation and mitigation in agriculture. Um, we saw from the ADB that there are a few large donors, so support is concentrated. And while that support is welcome, um, despite its importance for climate change, the sector receives less financing for both adaptation and mitigation. And of course, in particular, that means smallholders get less. Uh, at the same time, we saw that domestic expenditure on agriculture often goes to polluting inputs rather than to climate change activities. So the second point is that we see that a lot of the current support in the sector continues to reinforce the current systems and not promote adaptation. And things, the spending on the things that we really need, R&D, biosecurity, infrastructure and other services is a, not only a small percentage of agricultural support, but it's a declining one. So governments really need to be investing in those targeted interventions for adaptation and to help sustainable productivity growth in the sector. So moving beyond planning to implementation, monitoring and assessment. This is difficult because it means at the same time you have to do the short term recovery from shocks. You need to do those medium term incremental adjustments and also prepare for sort of long term transformation um, when the existing system is untenable. So in practical terms, what does this mean? I think we heard a very interesting presentation from the Asian Development Bank on climate smart agricultural um, practices to increase sustainable productivity growth, adapt and build resilience to climate change and, and reduce or remove emissions. And there's a range of technologies across water and weather, seeds and breeds, markets, financing and institutions that are all part of the picture. And encouragingly, many of these are low cost and scalable. We also heard very set of interesting practices by countries. Um, I think there were some common themes, technology and, and research and development for sustainable productivity growth, risk management incentives and pro, um, programs for farmers and attention to farmer income. Information uh, is key, communication to farmers and consumers, public investment and legal frameworks and strategies. So um, 
Mr. Sudarianto spoke about Indonesia's efforts at adoption and rollout of climate smart varieties. And I thought he made a very interesting point about not just the important role of technology in R&D, but the um, challenge of connecting this research to the agricultural ministry and to farmers through ag development programs. And again, I think he highlighted some of this, this tension between food security in terms of fertilizer subsidies, but also major implications for emissions. Tim um, outlined that uh, Australian farmers are highly vulnerable, but there's been a lot of activism on adaptation um, through information services, through commodity-based research corporations to sort of boost productivity and preparedness, and through risk management instruments. But he also highlighted the challenge of getting the incentives right for farmers to manage their own risk and how do you help those in distress without undermining those incentives. Uh, Mr. Sujimura from Japan stressed the need to, for cooperation across all stakeholders, public and private, and again highlighted the role of technology, this time some very high tech and sophisticated technology in AI, R&D on crop varieties, and using farm data to develop um, technologies for livelihoods and climate change adaptation. And he also highlighted Japan's important and welcome role in international cooperation. And so lastly, Mr. Tang from Vietnam highlighted the importance of the government strategies and the policy framework and really concerted action on public investment in construction solutions such as irrigation, non-construction, so trying to shift practices, crop conversion for sustainable production, and public investments to help farmers cope with drought and support conversion models. I thought he interestingly mentioned as well um, the importance of training. So that the key priorities of adaptation measures, forums for knowledge, financing and use of pilot programs, legal frameworks, um, those infrastructure and non-infrastructure investments and financial tools. So look, I think this has been a, a super interesting day and very interesting um, set of presentations. For us at the OECD, we'll, we continue in our work both on the agricultural policy and monitoring uh, and evaluation and food systems and food security and, music, and nutrition to look at practices in the region. Uh, we're working with the ASEAN Secretariat and officials from ASEAN countries to identify their priorities and key challenges on food security and to try and encourage the kind of cooperation in data policy and reporting across the region. So I think today has been a very good example of sharing good policy practices, sharing information and evidence. Uh, and also I hope to, to pick up the last point to help um, motivate and engage and get us more involved in um, the international uh, debate. So thanks to all the participants and thank you to the organizers for what has been a very interesting discussion. I hope you have a, uh, a good afternoon, uh, evening or, or day, depending on where you are. Thanks very much. And thanks all of you for connecting today. And don't, uh, don't hesitate to get in touch if you have further comments or questions to us. Thanks very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.